<laughs> All righty, welcome everyone to our artist talk this evening. My name is Julia. I'm the education assistant at Lansing Art Gallery and Education Center. And with me today, we have a lot of team members, particularly Allie and Kaylee, our interns that have been helping us. A couple staff members, you can raise your hands, Kyle and Barb, um, as well as a couple board of directors. So you wanna raise a wave to everybody. <laughs> We would like to thank our site sponsor as well, Norm Charles, he's here this evening. A little bit about Lansing Art Gallery and Education Center. It's been around for about 50 years, been a leader in nonprofit arts creation, a leader in public arts creation for 12. And Art Path, what we are here to celebrate tonight, is one of those programs. It's about, it's four years old now and um, it is due to the hard work of Katrina Daniels, our exhibitions and gallery sales director, and Emily Stevens of the Lansing City Parks and Recreation. They've been working very hard on it. It's thanks to them that we have this wonderful program. And without further ado, I will go ahead and turn this over to our wonderful artist this evening, K.W. Bell. Thank you so much. Can you guys hear me? Is this quick? Okay, very good. Thank you for coming. I'm so excited to be able to share a little bit about my sculpture. Um, and thanks for coming out to Art Path um, tonight. So this is called Sacred Sorrow. And I, I wrote a lot of what I'm going to say down. I think I um, read better than thinking on the spot. So I'm going to try to um, answer some of the wonderful questions that Kaylee wrote. She tailored them to me. She, I think she must have studied me pretty well. These are really excellent questions. Um, yeah, so uh, my artist name, uh, as Julia said, is K.W. Bell, but my name I go by is Karen. <laughs> I'm a sculptress, a painter, and a poet. And I'm gonna share about this piece, Sacred Sorrow, tonight, and also how and why I make art. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, uh, read the questions that Kaylee so kindly wrote and then I'll just respond. I might read a little bit of my response so I stay on track. Saying, how does your process differ when working in three-dimensional media? So she's at, it's basically asking me like, how does my painting influence my three-dimensional sculpting? And first, I just want to say I'm an idea-based painter, um, artist. So I always begin with a question or a theory or something that does or doesn't make sense to me. Um, sometimes my art is me yelling back at the world. Um, most often, I begin with an area in my life that I need to learn about. And while making art, step back, sorry, it's a warm. Uh, while I'm making the art, then I, I'll learn big ideas, and sometimes I discover that there is so much more I need to explore and learn. I've been told there's nothing new in art. There's, it's all been done before, so there's no such thing as really being original. But as artists, and as I move through my art journey, I touch on ideas that are new to me, and it's my desire to express them and to share them through my lens. And the world like, has so much noise, deafening eye noise. It's uh, visual noise, I, I say. And so when I make my art, I want to, I'm, I'm trying to encourage myself to slow down and to consider and to contemplate. And, and, and my goal is to help viewers and others slow down. Um, I don't want to just make more eye noise. So back to the 2D versus 3D. I consider all this and then I try to figure out what form of art will communicate my idea the best way. Will it be a sculpture? Will it be a painting? Or does it need a poem to go along with it? Um, so that's that's kind of how the 2D and the 3D influence one another. Um, 
it's really driven by ideas and how to best communicate those ideas. Uh, so the next question is how do I convey emotion through sculpture? Being an expressive person, emotions just ooze out of me. <laughs> so I'm gonna answer this question by telling a story about an emotional sculpture I made. And most likely I will cry during the telling, uh, but I'm learning it's okay to weep. So when my mom was fighting cancer, my siblings and I took turns taking care of my folks. And one time uh, after a procedure in the hospital, my mom slept and I waited and I waited. She slept a long time. And I started to admit to myself that her time on earth was winding down. My mom, my time with my mom was limited. I sketched to pass time. I drew a very detailed person of a picture of a person climbing out of the face of a clock. The glass was broken and the person was holding the hand of the clock above their head. And this is perhaps uh, showing triumph, saying that her life is ending. And she did her best. And perhaps it was indicating defeat, that time stole away my precious time that I longed to spend with my mom. But it was to remind me now, as I made it and I look at it, that I need to be in the moment at the time. So also, it might show that time wins. We waste it and it's gone. And most importantly, I think I drew it, as I drew it, I, I realized my mom was gonna uh, step out of time and uh, into forever. And I'm, I'm pleased to say her, her forever has a capital F. So um, after my folks passing, I, I did make the drawing into a sculptural relief, which was my intention as I drew it. Um, and it's, it's a reminder to me that forever is waiting, but I shouldn't allow the clock to steal away my precious time here on earth. And um, that piece was, is titled Out of Time, and if you want to um, know where you can view it, I can share that with you later. next question is how does my identity or how does your identity as a poet influence your visual art and vice versa so I do write poetry sometimes to explain a painting or a sculpture and I I write the poem not only to enhance the artwork but to often explain it deeper and I do try to make each um, piece stand on their own um, but when they're together, they're stronger. So um, if we have time and later you're interested, I, I, I can share one of my poems. The next question is where, where do I find inspiration and what inspired me to create this piece in particular? So inspiration is, wow, so many ideas run around inside my head every day. Um, I even sculpted a piece called Distraction. It shows ideas that are climbing up my head and dancing on top of my head and diving into my head and some bad ideas are diving out of my head and oh, so many ideas just distract me. Um, so I find inspiration most every day. I can say the day that I get most of my ideas or many ideas is Sunday while sitting in church. For years, during songs and sermons, I would see pictures in my head, in my mind, and I would confess and try to concentrate. <laughs> but I realized um, making pictures in my head, it wasn't a bad thing, it, was, it wasn't a diversion or a distraction. I realized this is my worship. So I, I find inspiration can be found in a comment somebody makes. It's uh, often a pushback on societal influence. 
Um, I know when I look at other people's art for inspiration, like the way they put down paint or present a sculpture, um, I, look, I look for techniques that I can learn. But as I realized my research, quote unquote, is really me just being scared to proceed with my, I, my own idea. Um, and, I, and I have to say that looking at others' work is often, it can squash me because um, I find artists that are so brilliant that I never, I, I know I would never attain their, their height of uh, ability. So I think that um, that is sometimes can be crushing. So I think the best motivation is to stick with my own ideas. And I think that more than inspiration, people need courage. So this piece, so this piece, my inspiration for this piece in particular um, is really came during this last, the uh, last crazy year, 2020. Um, it's been a hard year, and um, this, that's, yeah, it's been a very hard year. Worldwide pandemic, divisive political issues, disparities exposed, and then George Floyd's murder. And uh, I even put in quotes here to breathe. A little ironic. <laughs> Seeing and feeling the grief and anger and despair um, a group, a multinational group, um, our church came together to pray and to mourn together. And it was a time to lament. It wasn't a time to explain, um, but to listen and to weep. And so this sculpture was really uh, during our, we did, you know, everything Zoom. So you, you have like 25 heads on the screen and I peeked during the prayer and I saw hands on people's heads and I saw hands covering faces and it revealed to me distraught hearts and we were lamenting together and though it was a horrific refilled time I saw tragic beauty in communing together in lament I made a small sculpture and then when I heard about uh, art path I thought it might be a good time to share with more people, the important message. And so this is actually my first, um, it's like my debut into public art. And I just wanted to do a little show and tell here. So this was my um, little teeny piece that um, the hands, you can look at it later, but the hands were, oh, the hands were very important, sorry. You want me to hold something? Oh, that's all right. Um, that will just make me more nervous. <laughs> yeah, so you can look at it later, but the hands are what really is um, so expressive to me. Um, so that's a, a, another example of emotion in my sculpture. So, yeah. So I did a one eighth size of this monolith, and um, then I did the big one. So this piece, um, yeah. Uh, I made as a lament. So the question uh, is, did, did the location of the site influence my subject matter or creative process for this work? And I have to say, I already knew what my piece was going to be. And I think this is a really perfect spot for it. I think Katrina picked, oh, there you are, Katrina. There, uh, she just picked a perfect spot. I, it wasn't my, I, I, I had, I had thought of some other more central locations, but this is, this is just, um, perfect for my debut into outdoor art. And it's, this is the biggest thing I've made. So I'm, I'm really, really uh, honored to be part of Art Path. I am so thankful that Katrina is, is just bringing art to people. And, um, so I'm pleased to be part of that. Uh, so the next group of questions I am going to read all together and then I wrote something that I think will um, communicate more clearly uh, 
the, the answer. And so I, um, I'll read these questions and I'll pretty mostly read what I wrote. How has the pandemic shaped your work, creative process, and thinking about your work? Why do you think this installation is important to create at this moment? What do you see as the role of art in, in this present moment? And how can art speak to people and bring together communities? And what do you hope people will take away from this work? I was supposed to practice this with some people that I knew on Juneteenth. And I was so excited to, to, to explain this and practice this speech on Juneteenth. But um, we just recently celebrated our new national holiday. And I know that day is full of both joy and sorrow. And so standing here by this sculpture, Sacred Sorrow is very apropos. I think the new holiday makes room to listen, to understand, to accept that our nation has deep sorrow in its history. I'm learning that to live here now, it's my responsibility to acknowledge this and to care. So the idea for this sculpture, as I mentioned before, came from that room Zoom uh, prayer meeting and um, yeah, explained about it. So I wanted to erect a monolith, perhaps Maybe you guys saw the monoliths that popped up across the country um, during the pandemic. I think even even some in the world. Um, and I just thought somebody sharing beauty amidst such an ugly time, that really inspired me. It, um, it gave me hope. Monoliths represent a force of solidarity. Yet on the top of this one, sits a solitary figure depicting the vulnerable. This sculpture is a lament that embodies both a societal and personal struggle to listen, to hear the cries of our fellow beings, and to acknowledge one another's distress. It is my response for those who mourn. Trials and tribulations touch everyone, so it's natural for us to empathize with this lone figure. However, sorrow sits heavier on the poor, poor in spirit, poor in purse or privilege. It sinks deeper. It sinks deeper into the lonely and rubs raw souls that are already exposed to affliction. So, you ask, why then the title, Sacred Sorrow? And just a side note, the, it was prompted by a book written by Michael Card. Sa sorrow can take us to a sacred place. So when the superficial things of life fall away and we are confronted with the frightful quandary to ascertain meaning and purpose in our existence, laments are our bitterest cries and prayers the place we pour out our hearts, where we feel forgotten, forsaken, striving to make sense of life. This is a most sacred place. Is it possible? Could we dare to hope that our pain, questions, and sorrow touch God? And if God can be moved, cannot people come together in lament with those who have swallowed sorrow. This sculpture will stand still and weep. It's also an invitation to stand in solidarity. When we weep or encounter grief, we wish it would be wiped away. We long for relief. Could this be the time to wrestle deep inside our beings, our communities, the world, and acknowledge and join in the laments of the broken? A worldwide pandemic united the world with desperation, initiating communal commiseration. There is a universal understanding of distress, which long confinements of COVID-19 have perpetuated. However, instead of the world becoming a whole, 
It has left people even more disconnected and fragmented, and it has exposed disparities. This sculpture is for people to weep together. So my art path sculpture, I think, is relevant because um, recent events that I was, I've mentioned, you know, um, in society, we've had divisive disagreements on just about every topic, including the worldwide pandemic, political issues, racial reconciliation, justice, oppression, and the rights and wrongs of the people. I believe it can safely be said that distress, distress has touched us all. Each heart knows its own grief. This, this sculpture, it's my response to sorrow that has cried out and been heard. So let us weep with those who weep. I think it's, it's very important to have interactions across differences to begin to understand another's viewpoint. And this, this sculpture, I think, is a, big, a, a way to begin. It can stimulate conversation, perhaps controversy, but hopefully common decency to have compassion. We can see ourselves in this sculpture, but I hope it can open our eyes so that we can see others in it too. I, I have a few more things I can share, some questions here, um, general questions, but I don't know if anybody has a question maybe you want me to answer. Because I have other ones here that Kaylee so kindly wrote for me. And they're, I'm sure they're just burning it. Yes. I, I just wanted to make a comment before I forget when you were talking earlier about courage. And I thought that should be the next, your next sculpture. Ooh, I like that. Courage. <laughs> Actually, it is. <laughs> it is. I, I will have to tell you about that one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I'll just skip there. I won't do them in order. I'll, I'll do that one right now. So uh, other projects you're currently working on or what projects can we look forward to in the future? So I'm really, really excited. A little overwhelmed. No, a lot overwhelmed. I am been accepted in Art Prize this year. So I have a venue. I'm, I'm very excited. Um, so the sculpture is going to be made up of four almost life-size pieces that stand with their backs together. And it will be a tribute to four brave women and a courageous little girl who represent women who boldly changed history. My ceramic sculpture is, uh, will pay honor to a few of the brave females who pushed forward, changed history by escaping boundaries they did not regard the piece is titled, She Spoke, because they did not keep silent. And um, the idea started with some antique Model T wheels and spokes that my dad had around for a half a century. And um, it, yeah, it just kind of, one thing led to another, but it's also my desire to be more courageous. So it's, 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 it's sometimes I preach back at myself with my artwork, so. Um, yeah. The other question was, um, what's the biggest influence um, in my art, or on what, what's the biggest influence then? Uh, so I think learning or finally admitting that I'll never conquer art, <laughs> um, that there's always going to be room to get better, and that I'm never going to be as good as my inner artist desires. A friend once said that if I did conquer art, if I were able to make flawless art, then I should walk away and never make art again because there would be no more wonder. So I also have been stretched in my understanding of people and I've been um, had the wonderful pleasure to be part of a multinational group and community. Um, and I can, I, I see, I'm seeing the world through eyes of people who have different experiences from me. And I can, I see, I realize that the world is, is so much more. It's more broken, 
more beautiful, more complex. It's just more. And I'm learning to acknowledge others' experiences and their hurts, the unfairness of, in life, their frustrations. And I'm also realizing I can grieve. And it doesn't necessarily I'm, I mean that we're in total agreement, but I have to show com compassion. So that's what, what this one is about. It's, it's a lament. Um, so yeah, I, um, I think that's <laughs> pretty much what I have to share. So uh, yeah, if there's would, any other. Oh. Would you begin to tell us a little bit about the process of creating this? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was crazy. <laughs> um, my kiln died. My kiln died. Um, and my, my my good kiln person helped me out. To... It. I made this in two weeks before I installed it. And um, pretty much it was... I made the little one. And I learned a lot. I learned what not to do. Um, it was actually, it had another piece that was going to come down here, and that broke. And then I decided, well, monoliths are very much metal and tall, and so I, I extended it up. Um, so you're, are you asking for like? actual because yeah i'm curious i mean you went through all sorts of things with the size of it and, and yeah. how it fits in the kiln and... oh my goodness yeah you know what you really need to measure your kiln before you make things <laughs> <laughs> it's really important yeah the other thing is i am in pt to um recover from <laughs> throwing really heavy slabs around some of the slabs were almost 50 pounds and it was very a uh, lot of work but um yeah, um, the weather was just right to work in my garage, thankfully, really close to the kiln, so that, that, that helped me know. But it was terrifying to move things um, because green, greenware, when, the, when before it's like bisked, you know, before you cook the clay, is very, very fragile. And you wanna actually move it when it's um, a little bit wet. Um, but still structurally sound. So it, it was a rather interesting learning process. I think I've learned a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so. Yeah. KW? Yes. Uh, is this work or will any of the future works be available for sale to the public or are they not for sale? Oh no, th this is for sale. I, I was hoping Dodge Turner House was going to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, my daughter and my husband, um, we came out here and installed this together and we, we had rented these big, um, I don't know what you call it, the scaffolding. painters. What? The scaffolding. Sca scaffolding. And yeah, and then my daughter was holding it and because I couldn't because, you know, I'm in PT so, and I'm old so. Uh, <laughs> They, they were holding it and then all of a sudden my daughter's like, we gotta put it down, we gotta put it down. And so we put it down, we had to call somebody else. Some, we had to call in muscle. So um, yeah, but it is, and future things, I'm, I'm, I'm really hopeful. Um, I'll find out tomorrow if I get a grant, but um, I'm not sure. But yeah, and, and, and always talk to me, I, I can make you a deal. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Are you all up for a poem? Most okay. definitely. Um, I wrote this poem for a woman who had been in a very, life had been unkind to her. And uh, she had uh, turned in to herself and, and she was coming out, she was, she was kind of emerging. But I, I think this probably describes most of the world right now. We were in such isolation and now it's so beautiful. We can emerge, 
We have naked faces. <laughs> so good. So this one is called Uncurling. And I really want to learn how to read poetry like, you know, spoken word poetry, but anyway. Curled up, a ball of protection, a secure fetal position, tight collections of despair and anguish, deep in the middle, isolation strangles hope. Teardrops of dew rain in the night, dew drops flood the cold dark hours, longing for the warmth of a new day. With the sunrise, a gentle breeze whispers softly. Light touches tender, tender leaves of seasons past. Fragile tendrils uncurl timidly. A new fern, like a scroll, begins to open. Though at times, sipping dewdrops, she stretches upward with courage. And it's kind of like my little paraphrase uh, of a verse. In the night, there is morning, but when morning breaks, hope dawns. This one doesn't even have a painting or anything. It just had this little uh, scribble I did when I sent it to my friend. So um, maybe someday it'll have a painting to go with it. Well, not to be like all weepy or anything, but I have another one on weeping. <laughs> but it is about sorrow. <laughs> so, um, this was after my mom died um, and my dad, who they passed away very, very close, six weeks to the hour um, apart from each other. It's called The Yellow Flowers Weep. Oh, and there's a story I have to tell you. My mom always planted red flowers because my dad loved red flowers he passed away and she said i want yellow flowers this year so i went and bought yellow i think they were begonias i don't know my flowers they were yellow something they were beautiful and i planted them and then i planted some after my mom died at my house so this is titled the yellow flowers week the tiny flowers, the, excuse me, the yellow flowers weep for two tiny birds laying in the garden abandoned. No feathers cover their frail little bodies. Buried under the yellow petals, they weep no more. I have no feathers. I gave them all away. The yellow flowers weep for me. really not a sad person. I am most uh, losing joy and but yeah. I don't have uh, any um, demonstrations or anything to show you except my little piece there. Then I'd just like to give a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks for coming and listening to me.